I would now like to introduce today's presenters. Michael Jansen, Chief Research Officer, guides the practice's research agenda and architecture by leveraging his extensive experience to identify and unlock emerging trends. Akshat Vad, Vice President, leads the Global Engineering Service Practice for Everest Group. He works with leading enterprises and services majors on technology, engineering, and outsourcing. Mayank Maria, Practice Director, is responsible for driving the Publish Research Program, as well as custom client engagements in engineering services. And with that, I'll turn things over to Michael. Go ahead, Michael. All right, thank you, Claire. All right, um, I wanted to start today's uh, webinar here with a little bit of fun. And so what I thought I'd do is I asked Akshat and Mayank to show me their first phone. Give me a picture of their first phone here. And uh, my phone, which I was able to actually produce and show them on a video screen, was, uh, was the brick phone. It was an analog phone. It was a Motorola classical uh, brick that you could uh, use as a personal weapon if uh, nothing else, dialing out, dialing out on an out uh, phone call. Uh, I saw Akshat's, and he had what you'd call a telephone. You know, it doesn't have a lot of fancy gadgets to it. He said it was ultra reliable, almost uh, super durable. And then when I was looking at Mayank's phone, he said this was, he was, he's the youngest of us. And uh, he has the, his first phone was actually, what I think it's a clamshell phone and actually was one of the first multimedia. He could play music. He had some kind of a little primitive screen that they could do uh, some kind of video games. So you think about how the world has changed. I think all of us would look at it and say, hey, we've all got, we're, we're debating whether it's a five inch screen or a six inch screen and, and, uh, and how it uh, performs and all the good, uh, gizmos that you can do with it, but uh, we've come a long way since our, since even our early careers. So with that, let's talk about what we're here for today, which is, you know, uh, the 5G environment. And certainly uh, not, not going to surprise anybody with some of the first pages of content, but it's a good refresher kind of a level set here. Uh, from a value standpoint, um, certainly we, there's a lot of expectations that 5G is going to help on a number of fronts. Uh, the ability to connect people around the world uh, will have social benefits. Uh, there will be economic benefits. Um, and, and, you know, the hope is that we have new use cases and, and people will be able to do things they've not been able to do before. If there's a downside, I think, uh, you know, they're certainly going to, this is going to take a long time to get this to happen. Uh, the implementation is going to not be done and measured in months, and probably not even measured in years. It's going to take a while. Uh, the power requirements, a number of base stations, uh, it's estimated to be three times the current install base. Uh, so there's going to be, it's going to take some time. So I don't think anybody expects this to be, you know, hey, we're, we're, we announced the TV commercial or the, the new phones and we're done. So, so with that, let's take a little bit of a, a walk through history. We showed you the phones that we had, um, but let's just like kind of look at the, as we progress from 1G to 2G, 3G, 4G, and now 5G. And, you know, I find it interesting here. Uh, obviously, you can uh, make the first observation here. First of all, it's every 10 years, we get a new G. So I'm sure somebody in the laboratory is looking at the 6G technology, and uh, we'll be hearing about that probably sooner than we think um, and all the wonderful things it's going to do. Um, but you also see the progression of use cases. So, you know, uh, you know, before there was pagers, and, and you know, we actually used telephones to make phone calls and, and get voicemails. Uh, obviously the internet and, and progression here. But I had to look at this a little differently. I just came, did a, a, a cross country trip here. And I, I wanna remind everybody, while we can all get excited about a chart like this and all the wonderful things it's gonna do, I just did a trip across the US, 3,700 miles through the Southwest. And you know, as, as excited as we're all about 5G uh, phones, um, I've come to learn that the greatest lie uh, in, in out there that you can ever have besides a, a political commercial maybe uh, is a, is a cell, cell phone mobile coverage map. And so, yes, I'm excited about 5G, but man, I, there were days and days I was traveling across the U.S. when I wish I had 1G or 2G and man, 3G would, would, was a privileged conversation. So let's not forget that we have a, we still are still implementing, you know, in lots, large parts of us, even in, even in the U.S., uh, we're still pretty primitive when it comes to communication. So let's get excited about the new things, but also know that we have a lot more to go, even in the in the basics. So with that, Akshat, how do you see this world?
Akshar, are you on mute? Audible now? Yes, you are. All right, okay, there was some audio issue. If you could just go back to the previous slide for a second. Uh, let, let me talk about the last uh, step in that ladder, which is the 5G, right? Uh, that's our topic for today. So it's it's really the fifth generation technology standard uh, for cellular networks, um, and it's really a big you know leap in communications technology. It's going to bring significant advancements in the way uh, wireless cellular technologies and gene, and that's really the topic for us today. Uh, it's designed to provide lots of improvements in wireless connectivity, whether it is in terms of speed, latencies, coverage, throughput, and so on and so forth. Obviously, lots of promises, as you know, Michael Michael spoke about those. Um, you know, it, it's it's going to be a hard ask, uh, but let's just you know try and see what it is. Um, so it's expected that 5G uh, will be you know uh, up to a hundred times faster than 4G, and what that means is it's going to enable lots of interesting use cases, whether it is on the business side, whether it is on the you know consumer side. Lots of new interesting things will come up. There's a lot lot of traction around it globally. If you would see. Uh, the adoption has been gaining momentum, uh, whether it is the US, South Korea, China, you know, these are the front runners in terms of adoption. And in these locations, you'll see the operators, the likes of China Mobile, uh, Verizon, T-Mobile, you know, lots of them making investments and uh, kind of, you know, going towards piloting it in uh, multiple phases. So that's where we are today. Uh, now, if we if we try and uh, you know before we go deeper into the engineering perspectives, if we try and you know understand this a little bit more in terms of how it is different, right? Uh, if you would go to the you know next page, you would see that there are certain characteristics of uh, 5G uh, technology, right? Uh, 5G at the core of it means three very important things. First, it's an enhanced mobile broadband. Uh, it's typically called as EMBB. Uh, what that means is that there's a much higher throughput. Um, the um, you know spectral efficiency and capacity they stand enhanced, and there is a higher degree of mobility that can be provided through it. The next key thing is around the low latency communication. It's called ultra reliable low latency communication. Uh, obviously, this means uh, you know higher responsiveness, lower latency, and also you know the overall availability of the network and the reliability of it is is higher. The third key characteristic of uh, the 5G technology is the massive machine type communication. What that means is the you know density of the connection is very high. The uh, efficiency at which the energy is managed that's also very high. Right? So those are the three key characteristics which define 5G. Um, and you know to be able to do that, right? You know, we've got to understand that this is fundamentally you know different from any of the previous G's to be able to create this kind of um, a service, right? Uh, you need fundamental technology enablers as well. So if you look at it on the other side, there are multiple technology components which need to be put in place. So the first one is millimeter wave. Uh, that's the most important of it, I guess. Uh, it's it's using a you know different uh, range of frequency altogether. You know, they are uh, basically deployed on ultra short wave uh, radio signals. They are called as millimeter waves. Uh, typically, between 30 to 30 gigahertz is the frequency range. Uh, though in some initial deployments, the sub 6 gigahertz band may also be used. The next thing is the small cells. So uh, at the base stations, right? These are miniature base stations. They require much lower power to operate um, and can be placed every 50 meters, right? The antennas on these cells can also be much smaller. Uh, you know, given that. Uh, the, the tiny MM wave signals, they need to be transmitted from, from these, right? The third one is the massive multi-in, multi-out uh, you know, concept. So what we are really talking about here is the fact that uh, the base stations, uh, and they need to have an increased capacity of mobile network. They need to send and release, uh, receive signals from multiple users at once. So this is, this is also an important thing. And this is being enabled because there are smaller cells uh, and multiple ones of those. The fourth important uh, technology component here is that of beam forming. Uh, what that means is the millimeter wave, uh, you know, is, is focused, right? It's a concentrated beam is created, which points only in the direction of the user. That this this really helps in terms of you know reducing interference and ensuring that the data delivery is uh, is uh, you know routed in such a way that it's very efficient. The last and important thing is the full duplex uh, mode. What that means is the 
base stations and transceivers they can transmit and receive data at the same time and on the same frequency which you know potentially means that we are talking about double the capacity of the wireless networks right so uh, that's where we are uh, you know that's the background of the technology now before we you know go ahead and talk uh, further about the details of the engineering imperatives and you know where the adoption stands today uh, let me uh, let me pass it on back to michael yeah, so let's hear from you. Uh, let's get a quick view of this audience in terms of their experience with 5G. And so uh, Amanda's going to bring up a quick poll here and just want to get your view of how you're experiencing personally, not, not, your, not your company, but how are you personally experiencing 5G? And so if you can lock in your vote here. Okay, there's, this is not even close. And I know if I was voting, I would be in the same camp here. Okay, we'll give it uh, give it another five seconds. All right, so this is a lot of talk about something that, <laughs> that even the engineers that are probably more 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 technical and engineering folks here that uh, actually do not own a phone here. Uh, so um, yeah, I know they're, 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 the devices are coming becoming available, but. Uh, 80% of, of the folks on this call do not own one. And uh, the other 16%, I guess we can do multiple answers. Yeah, so 16% bought a device but doesn't have the coverage yet. So uh, again, we're all we're all buying into the promise it looks like. What do you think, Akshat? Absolutely, Michael, that's where it is. I think, you know, it's a, it's a chicken and egg issue. You know, you know, we're talking about consumption when the provision ecosystem is still getting ready. So I think, um, you know, I, I'm not really surprised by it. In fact, the next few slides, you know, will perhaps throw more detail on it. Uh, Mike, uh, you know, you want to talk about the state of adoption right now? Sure. Uh, thanks, Akshat. So, uh, if you see the current slide, uh, it essentially represents the latest data on 5G rollouts from GSM Association. And I think in a lot of ways, it paints a similar picture as we saw on the polls, right? There are pockets uh, across the world. Uh, there is the US, there is China, Australia, the UK, where you know the rollouts have been more significant, while other countries, Canada, the Western Europe, Japan, etc., they are they're still in the process of rolling out. But you see that majority of the map is still gray, which means that not a lot has been done, you know, most of the countries have still not seen even a single rollout of 5G. And while 2020 was being touted as the year for 5G, I don't think we are remotely close to that reality, right? And we need to look at some of the reasons that have kind of led us to where we are today. So if we turn the page, uh, I'll, I'll kind of walk you through some of those reasons. So of course the rollouts are delayed and there are some reasons that have played out there. Uh, Michael kind of alluded to some of this that, you know, there might be a requirement of three times the base stations as compared with some of the earlier generations of our networks. What that means is there is a whole lot of investment and effort required on the DSP front, which makes me think that potentially we were more optimi optimistic about the speed at which these networks could be rolled out and it will take some more time yet. On the other hand, there also were some uh, macroeconomic factors that played out in 2020, specifically talking about the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, you know, it of course led to supply chain disruptions. A lot of devices and components didn't reach in time. The uh, telecom service providers could not get their workforce out there to roll out these networks. Plus, even on the policy side, say by 3GPP, the uh, rollout of standards for non-mobile device uh, connectivity, right? Or the auction of spectrums that uh, got significantly delayed. Then of course, the US-China conflict wherein you know both the countries are trying to establish as the front runners on 5G technology and what that has led for a lot of companies is to uh, revisit their supplier relationships, their supplier contracts, again, adding to the delay. But another interesting thing to note here is that even at places where 5G rollouts have happened, the adoption continues to be lackluster. And 
you know, one big reason for that is what we also learned from the poll that a lot of uh, people still don't own 5G enabled devices, right? They tend to be costly at this point. There are limited options as yet. Hence the uh, adoption has been uh, a bit choppy, I would say. And even so, you know, the network rollouts that have happened, they are confusing our users in a lot of ways. So if I were to take the example of the US, right? There are millimeter wave networks and then there are uh, sub six gigahertz networks as well. So the users stand confused as to the if they buy a device, will it be compatible with both the networks or you know will they have to upgrade again? And hence they are playing much of a, a wait and watch here. On the enterprise side as well, uh, you know the enterprises they are touted to be much more benefited eventually when uh, they start adopting 5G. But again, they are waiting it out given that you know the standalone 5G rollouts are still limited. And with the dual connectivity 5G, they don't uh, stand to gain a lot, right? And on the other side, again, you know, the focus from the communication service providers, it has primarily been on launching 5G networks, right? Uh, at places where the networks are live, there is still very limited focus to come out with some uh, 5G bundled offerings specifically for enterprises. If that is not going to happen, I think you know the enterprises will stay away, and it will still take some time for them to come on board, right? So you know the situation is such uh, there is a delay, and of course you know it will take some time to for 5G to pick up. But uh, before I kind of close this section, there is one last thought that I want to leave the audience with. Uh, we decided to compare. Uh, 5G rollouts as they stand today with the formative years of 4G. And what we noticed was that, you know, we are not in as bad a situation as we would come to think, right? So in comparison, 5G is still in a better place today, say if you were to compare year on year, right? Uh, of course, you know, there has been a base effect that, you know, the overall requirement for wireless connectivity has gone up. Uh, having said that, 5G, number of 5G subscribers, which stood at around 18 million in 2019, just about 0.2%, I think, of the 8 billion overall uh, mobile connectivity subscribers. Uh, it is still expected to grow by more than 10 times uh, in this one year period. So by 2020, it will reach something like uh, 120, 190 million uh, subscribers and it will continue its growth, right? So while the adoption is slow, we are still very positive that uh, 5G will mean a lot of things to the world, both the consumer and the enterprise world. And we'll see more of this in the subsequent sections. All right, so uh, what we're gonna show you in the rest of the presentation, we're gonna show you how it's impacting the world, uh, both from a, uh, a kind of a consumer view as well as a uh, supplier or engineering uh, uh, ecosystems perspective. And then we're going to talk about talent, and then we're going to talk about the vendor community to, uh, that are providing services. So why don't we quickly move on to the consumer side, and uh, sure. we'll talk about that. Yep. Thanks, Michael. Uh, so I'll, I'll talk about how some of the use cases on the consumer side, and co by consumer side here, we mean both the individual consumers who are uh, opting 5G for their personal consumption, as well as the enterprise world, how they'll stand benefited once you know 5G is all out there. There are essentially two categories of use cases that we see. One are those uh, which already existed out there, but you know the efficacy or efficiency that uh, they can operate with uh, on a backbone of 5G that gets significantly enhanced. So I'll not talk about all of them here, but uh, I'll pick two interesting use cases. So the first one being the connected vehicles construct, right? We've had those connected features for a while now, right? You, you could get to some levels of personalization because uh, your vehicle, the infotainment systems, they tend to have some kind of an internet connectivity. But as 5G rolls out, we would get to a new tangent of V2X communication, wherein the vehicle is not only communicating with the driver or the uh, occupants of the vehicle, but there's also some uh, interactions with the environment. There is an interaction with 
you know, other vehicles, even uh, some of the broader infrastructure that exists out there, which kind of helps these vehicles fit really well into a smart city or a smart world construct, right? So all of that cannot be imagined without the low latency and high bandwidth features of 5G. On the other side, if you were to look at OTT streaming, right? Of course, again, these platforms have existed for many, many years now, but what 5G will enable uh, them to do is to uh, stream more uh, you know, high quality content. And of course, the experience will be uh, seamless, as seamless as we have it with the HD content today, probably 8K content could be uh, streamed with the same kind of uh, seamless uh, experience. Uh, moving on, uh, if we were to discuss some of the use cases, uh, which will be net new or you know use cases which still exist in the lab, but 5G could make them a reality and bring them to the world. The first one again that I want to talk about is from the automotive ecosystem, the auto, uh, autonomous uh, vehicles construct. So you know as soon as we have 5G connectivity and you know the latency bandwidth and coverage requirements of networks are uh, enhanced several fold the autonomous features could be rolled out to a broader um, consumer uh, base there as well as you know the level of autonomy that can be achieved in the vehicles that could be uh, increased several fold the other one that i want to talk about here is and i think that will be a very big use case uh, that's that'll be around smart factories of course we see a lot of enterprises already uh, establishing connectivity for their uh, shop flows, you know, enhancing the visibility. But, you know, as soon as 5G comes in, uh, the scale that uh, we will be able to achieve on the smart factories front, that will be multifold. And, uh, you know, we, we could achieve uh, next level of connectivity, the amount of data that we are able to gather from the equipment, all of that will increase. And of course, that will lead to significant efficiencies on the shop flows. So, so Mayank, I'm, uh, I've been watching the autonomous vehicles with great curiosity, and I've, I've watched a lot of things on the on, uh, beautiful situations on American highways where they can drive forever. I just can't imagine the, uh, the, the autonomous vehicle on a, on a street in Mumbai, but maybe, maybe I'm just kind of too pessimistic here. So well, I'll, I'll wait to see how you, you, you adopt that before I jump in. So with that, uh, let's move on to the, um, the supply side. What are the service providers looking uh, like there? Akshat, do you want to take that away and give us a, a quick view of that? Uh, absolutely, uh, Michael. Uh, and a quick check. Am I still audible? Last time I had a small glitch here. You're, you're good. You're good. Awesome. So I think before I go into that, I think the, the problem that you mentioned on autonomous vehicles, that's a very, very important one. I think 5G is a key enabler there, but there are also other issues around um, you know, having a very civilized way of driving like in countries uh, such as India. Uh, versus, uh, you know, some of the others where it is actually, uh, you know, much better. And there, I, are, there I, are multitudes of those problems there. Yeah, I think if you just close your eyes, it actually works better. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Anyways, um, getting back to the point, right? So um, the engineering uh, ecosystem for 5G, right? It's, it's fairly complex, right? Uh, pretty much everybody who's responsible for providing uh, 5G or rather the provisioning ecosystem entities right they have some of the other role to play right um and let's look at you know what ecosystem are we really talking about uh, there are there are variety of players as i said right so the first one that you know we can talk about is the core network equipment uh, providers so these are uh, the the companies who develop the central element of the telecom network uh, which provides the communication services to customers connected to it. Right? These uh, are essentially, uh, you know, uh, equipment such as routers, such as switches, bridges, gateways, um, repeaters, and and so on and so forth. Right. So that's that's one segment of the ecosystem. Companies who are in the business of uh, doing this. The second segment uh, is that of uh, uh, radio access network providers, equipment providers. So on the RAN front, um, these are the companies which develop the products that provide connectivity between the end user devices and the core network uh, using radio transceivers. Um, these products are responsible for coordination of network resources across the wireless devices, across the mobility management and data encryption. Um, the, the kind of 
uh, equipments that we are talking about here, they include base stations, towers, antenna arrays, network controllers. Um, the third um, entity that we'll talk about is the telecom service providers. They are obviously the ones uh, who are in the business of uh, providing these telecom services to customers. In some sense, they are the consumers of all the technology and equipment that the rest of the ecosystem provides. Uh, well, they are responsible for uh, the radio spectrum allocation and radio frequency access. They create and manage uh, all the wired and wireless networks uh, globally. The fourth segment that I'll talk about is the support system and solutions providers. Um, so the, this is a very wide array of uh, you know, uh, entities. Basically, uh, these are the providers of compute and storage infrastructure uh, systems. Um, they provide software platforms, architecture, software defined transformation services, even business intelligence services. Um, the OSS BSS systems are also kind of provided by them, right? So it's a it's a big array of uh, you know uh, providers who who provide systems and solutions which are which support the overall operations of a telecom company. Um, there are two more uh, you know that I'll talk about. Uh, the these are the cloud vendors. So these you know guys really provide the cloud based uh, cloud based infrastructure as a service offerings uh, to the TSPs. Uh, to run all of their workflows, right? They are also involved in providing the data center consolidation services and also services such as migration, next and technology capabilities in, in some interesting space. And I'm going to talk about that in a little bit uh, as well. And then the you know end device vendors. Quite obviously, at the end of it, in the in the telecom ecosystem, uh, you need devices to consume the services, whether it is mobile handsets, whether it, whether it is the modems, the customer premise equipment hotspots you know whatever else you can think of right so there are a bunch of companies who are in the business of providing these devices so they are also a part of the ecosystem the two remaining entities that i did not speak about uh, so far are the startups and the academia uh, they uh, you know i i would say they are uh, maybe you know the next layer of um, entities but they are still as important startups as an example they are driving lots of innovation and disruption they are doing lots of great work in spaces such as IoT, M2M, AI, big data, cloud computing, which are core to telecom. Uh, the academics, uh, academy on the other side, right, they, they are playing the role of researchers. Multiple global universities have set up COEs um, and lab infrastructure. As an example, University of Surrey, uh, they have a dedicated 5G innovation center and the researchers there have filed more than 15 patents in this space, right? So, um, so, so, you know, net net, it's a very, very complex and very, very vast ecosystem of multiple participants. Now, you know, if you start looking at the 5G uh, world, right? Uh, now, in the next slide, you will see that there are a very wide variety of uh, impacts that are created by the adoption of 5G. Uh, we've, we've chosen four for the discussion today. So those are around uh, the, the fact that 5G specific offerings will need to be created by um, the provisioning ecosystem. Right. And every um, participant in the ecosystem uh, will have their own nature of offerings which are required for the 5G world. The second one is around the increased relevance of open source. Uh, this has been a trend which has been gaining momentum even you know, without the 5G adoption. But with the whole new generation of technology coming in, the, um, the prominence of this particular trend, which is the uh, adoption of open source technology, it, it has you know, gained a lot of momentum. Uh, the third one is that of next gen technology leverage. So obviously, um, you know, newer networks, newer technology um, leverage is kind of, you know, increasing. We are, we are looking at lots of interesting uh, next generation concepts being incorporated as the engineering happens. Um, and lastly, the use case enablement and implementation. So we are obviously talking about lots of investments going into 5G rollout and deployment. So on the other side, there is, of course, a need to ensure that the enablement of use cases happen the implementation happens so that the ecosystem can economically sustain itself right so on these four dimensions there are lots of impacts and maybe let's just talk about them one by one so the first one that we're going to talk about is the 5g specific offerings on the next slide uh, you would see that um, the different entities in the ecosystem have different types of impacts uh, around this right um, so let's take an example of the core network guys. So since 5G is going to allow the intersection of uh, mobile technology and fixed line services uh, using a very standardized architecture, these guys, the core network equipment providers, they need to develop components which 
uh, which are which are using the standardized 3GPP architecture, uh, which enables the uh, fixed wireless access offerings. And these includes lots of different things: 5G modems, uh, millimeter wave radio frequency, ICs. Um, virtual EPC solutions and so on and so forth. And you would see that, uh, you know, the core network guys, whether it's companies like Samsung's or Huawei's, they have dedicated offerings for this uh, 5G FWA space. If you look at the TSPs here, the telecom service providers, they are also making, uh, you know, uh, lots of, um, uh, you know, uh, lots of investments are being made to ensure that you know they are able to support this so as an example of the initial deployments right uh, as we know the end devices will need to kind of continue to work on both 4g and 5g so this dual connectivity um, is something that they are supporting uh, another area that they are making significant investments is that of uh, the edge computing uh, which is fundamental fundamentally one of the most important use cases that uh, that uh, 5G enables, right? So to support that, they are, you know, creating lots of offerings which which uh, which help make uh, edge computing a reality, and and multiple other things. I you know I'll, I'll I'll speak about only a few in the interest of time. But if you look at the other ecosystem vendors as well, they also uh, are making multiple investments. Uh, if you look at the second key concept here, which is the relevance of open source, to me it is you know one of the most important things which is happening. Uh, so uh, the as I said, the open source adoption had been gaining momentum for a long time. With the change in generation, uh, this has become very prominent. Let's look at the RAN guys here. So RAN providers are migrating uh, towards modular and open source platforms. This basically helps in simplifying that network access. It also helps in the flexibility and the speed to innovate. So they're increasingly leveraging software principles, software-led design principles rather, um, to um, you know, open the proprietary interfaces that control RAN hardware and software. Um, as an instance, right, uh, you know, if you uh, look at Ericsson, um, they are increasing the open networking uh, initiatives um, and they leverage AI and automation in their open RAN equipment now. That's a fundamentally you know, uh, different way of how they have been approaching the RAN system so far. Clearly showcases that you know, open source adoption is, is on a rise. Um, obviously, in some way, the open source adoption is actually a move against proprietary. So you would see that multiple newer companies have also come up which are just you know only providing the open source ran technology which can be used um, another example that i would take here is that of the systems uh, support systems guy so uh, from a uh, you know development standpoint uh, these uh, are focusing on creating the open source software stacks and solutions uh, for the evolved packet network uh, and ran functionality uh, this basically helps accelerate the time to market for the equipment right so you would see that the you know ecosystem is kind of coming together here. Um, as an example, if you see HPE, they they launched an open source 5G core stack, which allows the deployment of 5G core network with very little upfront investment. Cisco is also kind of upping their play in this particular space, right? So so that was the second one. The third one is around the next generation technology. Uh, as I as I said earlier, um, you know next generation technology is key. Um, there are a variety of forms and shapes. Uh, in which this becomes relevant, right? I'm going to talk about a couple here. So the first one is around the SDN and NFE, and again, this is this has been happening for a while. Uh, 5G um, is is accelerating uh, this further, right? So networks need to be made more intelligent, uh, flexible, and, and software defined. Uh, basically, this helps ensure that uh, you know quick and secure data inflow and outflows happen, and the quick and um, enablement of new 5G applications also take place. So you would see that uh, the, the, uh, you know, the TSPs are upping their investments in the NFV space. Um, and you know, that's been happening in the ecosystem for some time now. Uh, another technology that I've been, I would talk about here is that of edge computing. In some ways, the cloud vendors have taken the lead here. Uh, they are holding the mantle as far as driving this shift towards mobile edge computing is concerned. So, uh, so cloud uh, you know vendors are uh, are uh, upping their their play in the in this space by offering cloud computing services to TSPs. Uh, this helps them build applications that deliver uh, you know single digit millisecond latencies to end users. Right? They're providing compute and storage services to TSPs uh, TSPs data centers at the edge of the five uh, G network. And you would see leading uh, cloud vendors uh, doing this. So leading cloud vendors. Um, they have made dedicated edge computing offerings for the 5G network. 
So the last thing that I'm going to talk about is the use case enablement and uh, you know implementation. So if you would uh, you know see the next slides, you would see that um, uh, you know whether it is uh, the the uh, you know 5G enabled offerings or the endpoints, right? Lots of new things need to come into place to ensure that the consumption happens. Uh, as I said earlier, right? This this is a space which is uh, you know which is going to require lots of investment from an from a deployment standpoint and obviously to monetize those deployments you need to ensure consumption happens later right so um, in that spirit you would see all the ecosystem entities uh, in their respective roles they are making investments uh, towards the use case enablement so the telecom services providers you know whether it is from a hardware standpoint whether it is from a software standpoint they are providing their own offerings uh, bundled offerings which include IoT devices support, end-to-end -end IoT solutions, even services which leverage 5G, such as OTT content streaming. These are all things which, you know, which are being put into place, um, and 5G uh, consumption uh, will uh, will something will be something that will enable this. Um, startups, uh, of course, are making a you know lot of uh, uh, impact in this area. So 5G enabled use cases, uh, which are a very modern in nature, leverage computer vision, AR, VR, right? Those are being enabled by startups. Uh, from a you know endpoints for use case enablement standpoint, so the end device manufacturers um, they are creating the devices which are required. So whether it is hotspots, whether it is modems, whether it is you know the the computing uh, devices or dongles, um, and you know all of these are being developed right now. So so that's where we are. I think you know as as you could see, lots of uh, impact, uh, lots of deep rooted impact in terms of uh, how the provision ecosystem needs to shape up. Um, I think we lost a slide between yeah. this. So and actually, we're going to move straight to the so the the talent part of the conversation here. So right. I can okay. turn that over to to Mayank and and I okay. think that we know all know that this all comes down to people. You've described all kinds of different aspects of the 5G. What do you look at it from the people perspective, Mayank? Yep. So uh, Michael, as it stands, uh, right. Uh, talent because there's so much change and flux happening in how you're designing your network, how you're deploying it. It all comes down to, you know, what are the new skills that are required, right? So if you look at even the traditional areas, uh, you know, around network design, network verification and validation, monitoring, of course, the some of the traditional requirements would still be relevant, but then there will be so much more that, uh, you know, will be required to do. So as a, an entity who is uh, playing a part in enabling this 5G ecosystem, you need to start thinking about how do you build capabilities around the new 3GPP standards, how, uh, you know, capabilities around designing networks as per the new architecture, there needs to be talent around small scale, uh, small cell engineering around network slicing capabilities, on testing again, new requirements around testing of hybrid 4G, 5G, uh, LTE 5G networks, which are kind of becoming prominent as uh, TSPs hurry into launching some of the 5G networks, right? Then of course, since 5G will also be enabling so many use cases, being context aware and developing test cases that you know can uh, measure the efficacy of uh, supporting network for particular use cases, those, those are some of the areas in which new re talent requirements will come up and of course then there are whole new uh, you know requirements which uh, the telecom ecosystem would not have had in the past uh, some of the things that akshat talked about say the open source platforms or stn nfp containerization will uh, gain prominence here then you know of course uh, thinking of being more agile and iterative where DevOps capabilities become very important. So NetNet, you know, the talent landscape is something that is going to evolve very significantly. And any player who aims to make it big uh, on the 5G revolution needs to start thinking about talent now. If we move on, uh, you know, uh, there is also a fact that we want to leave the audience with here around talent, that the war for talent is going to be quite aggressive when it comes to 5G. So what we did was we studied the top 50 recruiters of 5G talent as they stand today. And what we found out was that uh, cumulatively they have some uh, 
talent of around 30,000 for 5G and 5G related skills, which has grown at around 8% during the last one year. But the interesting thing to know, uh, note here is the last data point that we have here, that around 11% of the total employed talent pool also stands as open position for these players. So, you know, all the companies, players in this ecosystem are really talent hungry, hence uh, this war for talent will be quite significant. And, yeah. you know, uh, yeah. wherever... ...are quite small, actually, and, and uh, I would expect that uh, if we could have the talent, these numbers would be actually larger in terms of uh, the opportunity that's in front of us. Absolutely, Michael. And given the dynamics of talent that exists today, you know, this is where the role of engineering service providers becomes very relevant. There are many things that they are already doing today, and there's a lot that they can do. And I'll kind of invite Akshat to talk about that. Thanks, Mank. Uh, so if you were to go to the next slide, right? Uh, so the ecosystem is obviously looking to meet these uh, talent requirements. At the same time, um, the engineering services providers are playing a very important role. At the core of it, they are kind of fulfilling three important uh, needs, right? Um, so across the overall value chain of telecom space, right? So the first part is the components, the engineering of the components that go into the network. So whether it is semiconductor engineering, whether it is the de uh, development and testing of the uh, 5G hardware, uh, whether it is software engineering, which is required or testing. So everything that goes into the components and the engineering of uh, those components itself, right? So that's the first role engineering services providers are playing. They're providing services to enable that. The second part is actually to, uh, to the network itself. So while the first one was around the components of the network, this is around the design uh, development and the management of the network. So, um, so two parts to it. So there is a network launch and modernization aspect, and then there is the network operations aspect. So as you can see on the slide, there are a variety of roles across both of these, uh, whether it is the you know, planning for the sites and cells, uh, whether it is the next gen voice platforms, uh, whether it is the verification and validation of deployed networks. So everything you know on, on that block they do, even on the network operations front, uh, multiple services around analytics, OSS, BSS, uh, cybersecurity, all of these roles they're playing, right? Uh, their role doesn't end there. They are even, you know, they even go to the next step, which is around ensuring the adoption and monetization. So on that particular front, uh, they, they provide lots of services again. So uh, whether it is the platforms uh, that, that are required, they could be around CDNs for, or for IoT. They, they could provide services which are around the um, you know, deployment of private 5G networks. And of course, across a very wide variety of use cases that Mayank spoke about a few uh, minutes ago, right? They provide, lo they provide lots of solutions and services uh, which are geared towards uh, making the the consumption ecosystem ready uh, for for consuming this right so obviously lots of so so engineering services providers play a very very critical role in this space now if you look at this uh, from a different lens right enterprises of course need them if you could go to the next slide please you would see that they have certain expectations uh, from the the services vendors right um, broadly, we thought you know we, you could uh, create four uh, key expectations. So the first one is around the accelerated solution de development and testing. So we saw on the previous slide across the three aspects of the value chain, um, there is the the requirement for scale is going to be very high as far as the development and testing is concerned. So that's their prime expectation. A service provider should be able to do that. The second one is around the expertise in integrating the 5G network with other next generation technologies. Again, we spoke about earlier around uh, the variety of different technologies, whether it is AI, whether it is automation, cloud, um, or, or you know, edge, right? So uh, on all of those spaces, the expertise is something that they expect from the services vendors. Um, thirdly, for from a use case enablement standpoint, so technology is only one part of it. You also need the business context. So the providers are expected to have even that. And lastly, services beyond engineering, so which is around deployment and, and operations on an ongoing basis, uh, and even maintenance of these networks, right? So all of those expectations uh, providers have. 
so uh, as far as these consider uh, as far as these expectations are concerned right you could see that you know we are looking at uh, four or five uh, high priority considerations that enterprises would have first one is around the core capabilities cutting across the areas of network software and data second is very very deep domain and legacy so so the engineering services providers who have been in the telecom space in the while who have been on the journey towards the the overall evolution from 3g to 4g to now 5g um, that's something which comes in very handy um, third is a very significant scale in operations um, uh, obviously as as we spoke about on the previous couple of slides mayank mentioned the need for scale so the the scale in operations from a telecom engineering standpoint and also the ability to support it globally is very important right last two are are uh, very critical in nature um, the the one around ecosystem partners is all about ensuring that the service provider can orchestrate a variety of solutions and services not just which are within their own shop but which are available with the ecosystem right so multiple technology vendors multiple solution vendors need to be brought in and that's a key consideration that uh, enterprises have and lastly from a uh, from a investment standpoint um, the enterprises expect that the infrastructure needs to be ready right whether it is the labs whether it is the verification and validation infrastructure right all of those investments need to be in place right if you go to the next slide you will see that um, it's it's already happening the the services ecosystem is getting ready for this uh, across four key areas uh so we are looking at infrastructure investments uh, in a variety of spaces we are looking at ip investments uh, partnerships and certifications i wouldn't go into the details of all of these i realize we are running a uh, you know, little out of time here but but net net the services ecosystem is incredibly important and at the same time you know they are getting ready they are making investments on lots of different areas to make it make it a success all right so this is an incredibly uh big opportunity out there in the marketplace. Um, and, you know, you see it on so many different dimensions, whether it's the, um, you know, building out the applications or building out the, the demand side or actually building out the supply side. I think there's going to be opportunities on both sides uh, of the equation. Um, the pool is relatively small compared to other other uh, functions that we look at. But I think it, I think the it's probably understated in terms of the growth opportunities that are there. So. One of the things that uh, we do is we, we do provide market information and uh, market intelligence here. And we, I think this is a undoubtedly um, the, 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 the opportunity for, for many to play is, is, is great. And so one of the things we're offering to do is, is take advantage of one of our uh, insights, our own services, get a taste of our data in terms of building out your business case. And so one of the things that uh, Akshat and his team would like to do is, is get you to uh, ask the question, you know, how are your competitors, how do you compare to your competitors and what's it look like? So what we're going to do is open it up here um, and do a, uh, what we call a little quick poll here and say, if you're interested in getting a competitive intelligence that talks about the scale of the workforce, the ecosystem, the infrastructure investments, some of those, those things for one of these uh, or two of these actually vendors here, let us know. And uh, Amanda, if you could open up that quick poll and what we'll do here is um, uh, send you a follow-up email here uh, to uh, to get your needs. And what this is going to actually do is take you to a, we'll give you a link to take you to uh, an opportunity to fill out which which ones you're interested in, in learning more about. Okay, uh, we'll close that off. And uh, yes, yeah, so it looks like a lot of folks are interested in that. Uh, so as we conclude this, um, actually, why don't you describe a little bit about what your team does? We'll just do a, a two minute commercial here in terms of how you guys are trying to help your clients. Absolutely, uh, Michael. Thanks. So, uh, you know, folks, um, I'm sure most of you are well aware of what um, Everest Group uh, does and what's the value we bring to the ecosystem. Specifically, from an engineering services standpoint, there are two ways that we engage. Um, there, are, there's, there's a format, you know, which is more a membership-led uh, engagement, and the, the, the other one is more projects. So, from a membership standpoint, uh, we intend to, uh, you know, help drive efficient and informed sourcing decisions, and that's on two key levers. First is around published research. Uh, obviously, you know, being analysts of the engineering services market, we invest. Um, proactively in building uh, best in class research reports and data assets which uh, which cut across three or four key areas so as far as the service providers landscapes are concerned um, sourcing trends 
technology trends um, as well as the talent and location trends you know these are some of the key areas that that we cover um, and obviously we cut across a very wide variety of uh, engineering verticals and uh, horizontals right uh, engineering services space as you know is very wide in 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 this particular context so you know uh, our published research intends to cover most of the aspects related to the key verticals and horizontals the membership also gives you access to uh, our analyst on an on an on, on demand basis uh, this is leverageable in a lots of uh, different ways uh, so you know any of your ongoing business needs uh, wherever there is need for some data some validation uh, some point of view from an informed analyst we are we are here to help you um, so typically custom data cuts discussions with analysts um, uh, in in a, you know quick short notice or debriefs on some of the reports that we've done these are all things that you know you could do using this mechanism the other side of it is projects uh, and you know we've segregated this by enterprises and service provider customers so for enterprises we obviously are playing the role of advisors so from that standpoint um, the aspects that we touch around their uh, you know broader global engineering services sourcing are around locations talent intelligence amongst you know what's been happening uh, in, in some of their peers intelligence on specific vendors right um, even helping them evolve their broader engineering charter and looking at how to leverage global sourcing that's that's you know something that we provide uh, on a custom basis for service providers um, we provide three different values um, it's around strategy strategy takes lots of different forms and shapes it's you know it could be around a specific opportunity that you're looking at it could be around go to market for a for a specific domain like 5g perhaps right it could be around inorganic growth uh, right so we could come in and advise on that uh, the second value is differentiation so uh, helping you uh, differentiate yourself better uh, helping you uh, create a better messaging uh, providing you lots of content uh, which is uh, industry leading in terms of thought um, and helping you with you know webinars and workshops all of this is something that we do on an ongoing basis lastly around growth so providers obviously um, you know intend to do more business so helping them in terms of intelligence on accounts um, strategy for those accounts helping them in live situations where they are in deals uh, right you know we, we help with all of that so that's a that's a quick roundup on the value we provide we look forward to you know engage with uh, many of you in times to come uh, with that back to you michael yeah so let's address some of the questions we've got here and i'm going to go to the first one here is what opportunity do you see for cybersecurity services at consumer and service providers M michael could you come that come 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 again yeah. on that one please what, what yeah. do you see about cybersecurity aspects of this so cybersecurity is actually you know very very important if you look at the 5g stack uh, again that that would vary by which entity you're talking about but uh, cybersecurity is fundamentally important in this space um, you know whether it is at the network layer whether it is at a device layer uh, whether it is around data all three aspects of cybersecurity are incredibly important so the providers of you know these technologies for cybersecurity they are they have a field day you know they they it's not something which is completely uh, you know reached its maturity in fact one of the spaces that i spoke about open ran as an example right one of the key issues there is about uh, ensuring security right you are making your systems open um, and interoperable they need to talk to uh, you know uh, systems from different vendors and that allows for a lot of seepage um, which could lead to security risks so um, cybersecurity entities definitely have lots of work to do, uh, and they're going to be a very, very important component of the ecosystem. Okay. What about the 5G engineering service providers that are sit beyond the support system providers, the enablers? Um, so, from a cybersecurity standpoint? No, it's just generic. It says, what about 5G engineering service providers beyond the support system providers, so the enablers? So, so, I so those are the ones. There's a whole ecosystem beyond the ones that we put on there because you you had limited space. 
Right. So actually, those are the ones that we spoke about when we, you know, when we discussed the role of engineering services providers. So those were not really the support providers. These are the companies who are helping each and every ecosystem uh, participant that we spoke about. Um, it's actually a big, big market space. Five G is a huge opportunity for uh, service providers. Uh, they help in development of systems. They help in design. They help in network deployment. They, they, they are pretty much there across the entire value chain. Okay, uh, and one more question we'll do here, uh, and another question around security. So security is a uh, interesting topic. Is how can we ensure security requirements are are meet are meeting uh, use well? Okay, how 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 do we how do we ensure security requirements are using open that we when we're using open source? You know, how do they meet support related requirements for that? I I wish I had a good answer to that, right? You know, that's a one that's a very technical question, but I think that's that's an open problem statement for the ecosystem. The the gurus are really working on it right now. Um, that's it, that's precisely what I mentioned earlier. That um, you know, in in open source uh, setups where you have interoperability built in, you have um, different um, solutions and systems from different vendors. Um, in in that kind of a setup, uh, security is a key challenge. It all boils down to certain standards uh, and and you know guidelines that you follow, uh, but it, it's still something that needs to be addressed uh, on a case to case basis. I must say this does make the job of uh, the chief technology office and the chief information office a lot more complicated than it was earlier. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. Uh... Uh, appreciate you, you, all the insight you provided to us and, and the audience members. Um, and so with that, we're going to wrap it. Uh, there's a lot of information up on our website uh, that you can get access to. Uh, certainly uh, a lot of questions on how do you get the, the slides and there'll be an a email sent to you after uh, the session and uh, you can get the slides from there and the links there and as well as the replay. And with that, uh, we thank you for your time and appreciate, uh, let us know if there's anything we can do and appreciate your, your attention.